the late Middle Ages saw the rise of a number of readily recognizable people groups in the West, and one of those groups were the Ottoman Turks. So in this video, I'd like to take a look at the early Ottoman Empire from its birth under a dynast named Osman in 1299, all the way up until the death of Selim the Grim in 1520. And if you're wondering about the image on your screen, this is something that I found during a Google search. Apparently it is now a trend for people to take modern popular movies and then portray them in Ottoman style art. So here, this is the movie Scarface. However, it is set in an Ottoman looking scene and Scarface is using a, you know, an Ottoman looking musket. So at any rate, um, we'll just pretend that this isn't here and move right along into our discussion of the actual Ottoman Empire. When the Seljuk Empire had broken up during the 11th century, one of its remainders was the Sultanate of Rum, and this had been a major opponent for the Byzantines and also for the Crusader Kingdoms after the First Crusade. By the 13th century, the Sultanate of Rum still technically existed, although it had been greatly weakened. And the weakening really happened in the 1240s. Now you would think that because of the destruction of Byzantium during the Fourth Crusade that the Sultanate of Rome would have really prospered, but they did not have that kind of luck because of the Mongols coming through and really disrupting everything, just like they did in Eastern Europe and all across the globe, really, at least if we're looking at the Old World. So, um, the Sultanate at that point, after the Mongols had defeated them in battle and, um, you know, established hegemony, divided up among the various princes and they began to fight for control. Um, at a certain point, the uh, Seljuks had successfully appealed to the Mamluks to come and throw off the Mongol yoke. The Mamluks um, duly arrived and they were able to defeat the Mongols in battle once again. But then they left after the Seljuks, uh, you know, showed very little gratitude and uh, showed no inclination to follow the Mamluks. And um, that left the Seljuks open to another Mongol invasion. The Mongols came back and made good of their earlier losses. Now, um, after this point, when the Mongols lay the smack down a second time, the Seljuk state began to splinter into various emirates. Um, and also the new term that arises is Balik. And these are basically just local dynasties under um, new leaders who are trying to break away and form their own power base. Most of these people don't seem to have been all that ambitious, and most of them just wanted to have their little corner of Asia Minor and rule in peace. But one of them, and well, along with his successors, was quite a bit different. The Beyluk whom I was referring to was named Osman, and he is the guy who gives his name to both the House of Osman and the Ottoman Empire. Now, beyond the name of Osman's father, which is some sort of really hard to pronounce Turkish word, um, we actually don't know very much at all about his family origins or his tribal affiliation prior to the establishment of his Beyluk. We do know that when he declared himself Beylik, a lot of the local Turkish tribesmen in the area rallied around his leadership in the year 1299. Now, Osman is often called Osman Ghazi, or Gaza, usually Ghazi with an I, um, and his son Orhan will also be called that many times. Um, and originally it was thought that they were Islamic holy warriors who were waging a war against Christianity. However, you know, in retrospect, now looking at it, it's pretty clear that they were not holy warriors and that the word Ghazi probably has a lot more to do with sort of a way of warfare based on raiding and sort of a um, raider's mindset. And it has not all that much to do with religion for the most part. Um, that being said, Islamic identity was a part of the Ottoman identity from an early time because they're right on the border of the remains of the Byzantine Empire. And um, so they will have some Christian versus Muslim battles. But for the most part, their expansion is probably thought of more in a secular sense. 
And we have evidence that from the beginning, the House of Osman ruled over a secular state. And we'll see that repeatedly as we move along. Now, um, this state, even from the beginning, was not ethnically exclusive. Um, and it would use that um, lack of exclusivity to attract non-Turkish people who happen to be Muslim or willing to cooperate with this regime in some way to participate. One of the major aristocratic houses of the Ottoman Empire would join at this early stage, the Kosi Mahal, and these people were actually a Greek Christian family that had converted and chosen to follow Osman. During one of his uh, dreams, this is a later invention by the way, not a real dream most likely, Osman had a dream where his descendants basically ruled the world. And when he told this dream to his um, vizier, the vizier said that this dream would only come true if Osman married his daughter. So Osman married his daughter, and the product of that union was the next ruler of the Ottoman Empire in its infancy. So if Osman is kind of this semi-legendary charismatic figure who founds a new dynasty and goes his own way, then it's really his son Orhan who sets the ship of state in the right direction. And it's Orhan who founds what we would think of as the Ottoman state in the proper sense. Um, it's only under Orhan that we really see an early form of Ottoman government that is recognizable to modern eyes. Um, his main achievement, or at least the one that stands out the most as in terms of uh, really being conducive to the long-term success of the Ottomans, is that he manages to create a standing army. Now, standing armies in the Middle Ages are pretty rare, and just to sort of show you how rare they are, it's worth noting that France wouldn't have a permanent standing army for another century. England, by this point, had had one, but not for all that long. So, in this sense, Orhan is right on the cutting edge of state development. Now, um, Orhan was somewhat fortunate during his time because the Byzantine Empire, which could have posed a major threat at this point, devolved into civil wars twice, once in the 1340s and another time in the 1350s. And in, in both cases, there were contenders who wanted to hire Orhan's men to um, help them win the throne. And in both cases, this meant that Orhan was receiving pay and that his troops were able to exact concessions. So at one point during the Second Civil War, um, part of the deal whereby Orhan sent troops to aid the Byzantines was that they would give him a European fortress. So that gave him a small foothold into the Byzantine Empire. I believe that was in 1352. And then two years later, in 1354, um, there was a big earthquake on the uh, at the city of Gallipoli. You know, the famous site of the World War One battle. And when the city's walls were devastated by this earthquake, Orhan's son took a bunch of men and seized the city. So now there were two Ottoman footholds in Europe. While we're on the subject, let's look at the army that Orhan created, the Janissary Corps. Now, the Janissary Corps is one of the most iconic military arrangements in world history. And it most likely was founded by Orhan, although there are some scholars who attribute the formation of this fighting unit to Murad I. So the way that this system works is that recruiters would tour the empire and look at the sons of their Christian subjects. And the strongest of the 6 to 14 year olds would then be taken as slaves and forced to convert to Islam and then trained to be soldiers. And when you were taken into the Janissary system, you were a servant of the state. You were not someone who was allowed to marry or pursue another vocation. When you um, finished your training and became a full-fledged member of the Janissary Corps, you were actually then promoted to a high social rank. You would become a member of the Oscari. Um, that just means the sort of highest or most honored rank in society. And from there, some people would remain as soldiers. The vast majority would just be, you know, your regular soldiers. 
but many others would eventually rise to high positions in government and the army. Uh, many grand viziers were janissaries who rose through the ranks. And when you got too old to serve as a soldier and you retired, you were eligible for a pension, not unlike Roman legionaries. So the Janissaries up until the 19th century tended to be very loyal, and in their earliest years, all the way up until probably the 17th century, the Janissaries were extremely effective and they were one of the world's premier military formations. So to recap, Orhan has built up a formidable army in the form of the Janissary Corps, and he has at least two footholds into Europe. So it kind of makes sense that his son and heir, Murad I, decides to focus on Europe rather than Anatolia. So Murad moves quickly and seizes the city of Adrianople in 1363. The city he will rename as Edirne, and this will become the Ottoman capital all the way up until 1453. Now, despite the fact that his early moves were against the Byzantines, his focus was actually on the Serbs and Bulgarians, who posed a much greater threat to him in the long run. They were much more vital powers, and they possibly had the potential to drive him from Europe. So, they were his main target. At a certain point during his reign, he most likely did some sort of reform or um, expansion of the Janissary system, based on what we talked about earlier. He also is responsible for formally creating the Sultanate. So before this, there was really not um, a title of Sultan among the Ottomans. So he creates that at Edirne. And he also creates a court to be around the Sultan. And he creates the first provincial division between Europe and Anatolia. Um, by the end of his reign, he has won enough victories that he receives tribute payments from the Serbs, the Hungarians, and the Byzantines, meaning that he is the preeminent power in Europe as well as his little corner of Anatolia. And he actually ends up dying in the hour of his greatest triumph. In 1389, he won a major victory at the Battle of Kosovo over the Serbs, and um, after he died in battle... He left his heirs with a very strong empire and in a great position with many options. After Murad died in combat, he was succeeded by his son Bayezid I, who quickly earned the sobriquet Thunderbolt, or sometimes Lightning, for his frantic energy and his constant engagement in warfare to expand the Ottoman state. Now, Bayezid opened up his reign by going to Anatolia and achieving victories over some of the minor Tur Turkish beyliks in the area. So, he was focusing on the east for the first time in a generation. In Europe, he wanted to finish off the Byzantine Empire and capture the city of Constantinople. And this seems to have been his primary objective in the west as he actually left a force in place laying siege to the city for from uh, 1394 all the way to 1402. And in 1394, to secure his northern flank, he actually launched an, a failed invasion of Wallachia, which was defeated by an ancestor of Vlad the Impaler, who we'll revisit soon. Um, by 1395, Bayezid had also conquered northern Greece from the Byzantines, and he had conquered Bulgaria as well. In 1396, Bayezid achieved his greatest victory when he defeated a crusade led by the king of Hungary. What had happened is the Byzantine emperor who was besieged had called for a crusade to relieve him and drive the Ottomans out of Europe, and the king of Hungary had responded and put together an international coalition, and they had gone on a crusade. This resulted in the Battle of Nicopolis, which Bayezid duly won. So this was Bayezid at his peak. But then, um, you know, I guess where there's lightning, there's thunder. Or maybe the phrase is where there's thunder, there's lightning. And sometimes you get struck. Alright, that wasn't as cool as I thought it would be, but you get the idea. Bayezid and Timur the Lame had an understanding where there was going to be a boundary between their spheres of influence. However, Bayezid being the hyperactive and aggressive ruler that he was 
had attacked a Balak under the protection of Timur the Lame in 1397. Now, Timur the Lame, one of the characteristics of that ruler is that he did not take kindly to violations of his trust or aggression at his expense. So, he planned a grand revenge, and in 1400, he stirred up a revolt among the Baliks that um, Bayezid had just conquered, and then he arrived himself with his own army. And Bayezid was also not the kind of guy to back down from a challenge, so he also rouses up a major army, and the two forces will clash at the Battle of Ankara in 1402. This is a major, hard-fought battle, but in the end, Timur was victorious, and Bayezid was captured, and his army, of course, was defeated. Now, after Bayezid is captured, he lives in captivity for about a year, and then he dies, and the four sons of Bayezid will fight over the throne for over a decade. Um, they were encouraged in their civil war by powers like Timur and the Byzantines and others, but in the end, after about 11 years of fighting, Mehmed I will overcome his other three brothers and restore order to the Ottoman Empire. Although it's worth noting that um, his victory did come at the expense of most of what Bayezid had accomplished in the East. So, more or less, he was back to what his grandfather Murad had ruled over. But still, it's better than having a divided realm and the kind of chaos that had been going on for the last decade. When Mehmed I died, he left the Ottoman Empire in the hands of his son Murad II, who was only 17 when he came to power in 1421. And there were some other claimants to the throne that the Byzantines were willing and able to sponsor. So, two different claimants were sponsored and funded by the Byzantines during the reign of Murad, and he had to expend a lot of time and energy dealing with these pretenders. He also fought wars against all of his empire's neighbors, and many of these wars were simultaneous ones. Um, he did, however, manage to conquer Serbia and a lot of other Balkan territory over the course of the 1430s in between dealing with other problems. His crowning achievement came in 1444 when he defeated the Crusade of Varna, which was led by Hungary, Poland, and Wallachia, and he decided to retire that year. He was still young, but he had been fighting his entire life, and he seems to have been exhausted. However, later that year, he came back to power when there was a Janissary revolt, um, and his son had asked him to come back to deal with it. And eventually his son reproached him for, you know, leaving so early and leaving these problems in his lap. So Murad II came back to power after a short retirement, and then in 1448, he won the Second Battle of Kosovo. So, to make things a little more confusing for you, Murad I won the First Battle of Kosovo, and Murad II won the Second Battle of Kosovo. Um, and then, to really avenge his father Bayezid, or grandfather Bayezid, excuse me, Murad went campaigning in the East, and he managed to basically reclaim almost everything that Bayezid had lost, and he even managed to defeat one of Timur's sons, in 1450. However, he returned to the Balkans in 1451, and he lost some campaign somewhere in the Balkans, and over the course of the winter, he happened to pass away, and then left the son, I mean, left the empire in the hands of the son who had ruled it briefly in 1444. That son was named Mehmed II. With the exception of Suleiman the Magnificent, I think it's pretty safe to say that Mehmed II is the next best-known Ottoman Sultan, and he quickly earned the sobriquet the Conqueror. So in 1451, he took power. He was an ambitious 19-year-old. He had tasted power as a preteen when his father had decided to retire in 1444, and now he was a ruler in his own right, and he was completely ready. So, as soon as he came to power, he shifted the empire's priorities to taking the city of Constantinople. His great-grandfather Bayezid had tried to do this and had spent 10 years besieging the city, but at that point, Constantinople was still a tough nut to crack. However, by Mehmed's time, there had been significant advancements in cannon technology, and Mehmed seems to have been a lot smarter than his great-grandfather. So, before he marched his army to Constantinople, he ringed the entire city 
and all of its entrances with fortresses. And then he raised a tremendous army of 80,000 men. He had 320 ships, and he also had 70 heavy cannons and mortars built, including one cannon that was the largest ever constructed up to that point in history. And in 1453, he was looking to take the city by assault and not by siege. After all, Constantinople was still a formidable place, and because of the low population there and the amount of land in the city that was now open to cultivation, it could hold out for a very long time. So Mehmed was looking to win decisively by assault. And he does. And after his conquest, he also claims a new title, Caesar of the Roman Empire, which is accepted by the Orthodox Church, which is now under his jurisdiction, and he will establish a fairly positive relationship with the Christian community in the Ottoman Empire. Even though, actually, the, his predecessors had also had a decent relationship with Christians under them as well. I mean, aside from the weirdness of, you know, the Janissary Corps taking sons into... Uh, you know, from Christian families in the service as slaves, but, you know, that apparently wasn't as big of an obstacle to good relations as you might think. Anyway, um, this is when the Ottomans really took hold of a claim to be the third Rome. That claim was also claimed by uh, Russia. Um, both of them have some legitimacy to their claims. Both of them do imitate uh, Rome in many ways. At any rate, um, as soon as he retook Constantinople, he designated it as the new capital of his empire, and he invested lots of resources in the repopulating the city and rerouting trade routes to go through Constantinople. For a while, um, the trade routes had been altered to um, you know go to places that actually mattered, um, or you know they were trying. Uh, the Italians and um, Ottomans were competing for trade resources. But at this point, Constantinople is back to being prominent. And uh, Mehmed actually, uh, despite all of his efforts, Constantinople was still massively underpopulated by the time of Mehmed's death in uh, 1481. But he got the ball rolling and eventually the city would be fully repopulated and it would be one of the major cities in the world. Although he had already earned his sobriquet by achieving something that his people had been dreaming of for years, Mehmed wasn't done, and he made many other conquests, and I haven't even listed all of them, these are just some of the highlights. So in the 1450s, right after he was done conquering Constantinople, he conquered Serbia, and he managed to push all the way up to the city of Belgrade, and this border would hold all the way until 1521 when his famous successor, Suleiman the Magnificent, would finally push beyond that and go all the way to Vienna. But that's a different story for a different day. One of Mehmed's most notorious campaigns was when he fought a war against Wallachia, which was then under the control of Vlad the Impaler, better known in the history as Dracula, from 1459 to 1463. And that war took on a bit of an aspect of holy war in the sense that... Um, Vlad was an ardent Christian who murdered Muslims for fun, and Mehmed did retaliate to some extent. So that was a brutal war, and eventually Vlad was done in by a rival who was getting money from Mehmed. Um, he also finished off the two splinter states of the Byzantine Empire that were still around, namely the Despotate of Moria, which was under the Paleologi, or Paleologoi, excuse me, who were um, the relatives of the last Byzantine emperor, Constantine XI, and the long-lived empire of Trebizond on the north coast of Anatolia, which had been around since right after the Fourth Crusade. So by conquering these states, he officially ends um, all claims to there being a Byzantine empire or an empire which traces itself back to Rome. And that does enhance his um, claim to being the real successor to Rome. So in his mind, this is something which really legitimizes his claim to be the new Caesar. Um, he also reestablishes Bayezid's control over all of the Turkish Beyliks. This is something that his father, Murad II, had started, and uh, Mehmed, being the conqueror par excellence, will then uh, take this task up and really um, complete it. He also is the first Ottoman ruler to establish a foothold in the Crimea. 
So he, in 1475, the Ottomans seize the southern coast of the Crimea. Um, so it's a similar territory to what the Byzantines had held in the Crimea. And this gives them some um, access to Russia and the grain supply up there. And also will lead to a rivalry between um, the Ottomans and the Russians that will characterize the early modern period in the long run. Um, one thing that Mehmed did that really sent shockwaves through the West is that he actually sent an expedition to Italy. It's really unclear what the aim of that expedition was, but it sent a lot of uh, fear throughout uh, Italy. And it doesn't look like that expedition actually achieved all that much other than you know scaring the bejesus out of the Pope and all of the other uh, powers that be in Italy. Mehmed II then died in 1481, and his successors would continue to um, carry on his legacy. And one of those legacies is another thing that we think of when we think of the Ottoman Empire, the law of governance. The one problem that haunts all monarchies is establishing a standard for legitimacy that will be accepted by all parties, and especially by all parties who are vying for control of the throne itself. Well, the Ottomans under Mehmed II actually came up with an ingenious but brutal solution. So Mehmed actually formalized a right that had sort of been an informal thing for several, for a couple generations at that point, when he um, formalized the right of a sitting sultan to remove any shahzads that he saw as a threat. And a shahzad is any Ottoman male who has a claim to the throne by virtue of blood. So anyone who is a brother or son, especially sons, of a sultan. So um, the new system is run where every eligible male, mostly the sons, after they reach the age of 12 will be sent off to one of the empire's various administrative units and all of these sons will be equidistant from the capital. And when the father, the sultan, dies, all the sons will try to return and generally speaking the first one to actually get there will become the sultan. And that sounds kind of ridiculous, but it actually worked pretty well in practice. Other times, the candidates will really debate amongst themselves and then choose the son that is best qualified. Um, so sometimes the strongest son will win out because he'll have supporters in the capital which, who ensure his victory. And if you're a Shahzad who is condemned as being too much of a threat to the new regime, then the accepted method of death is death by strangulation. So what would happen is this person would be um, strangled in a private palace, um, usually by some sort of servant, and then disposed of. Now, again, this is one of the characteristic practices of the Ottomans, and it has roused a lot of controversy, but I would point out that it's pretty effective. After all, the House of Osman ruled over the Ottoman Empire all the way from 1299 to 1922. And to the best of my knowledge, I think there are some dynasties in India which try to claim that they've lasted longer. But in terms of a major dynasty which ruled over an actual empire, um, the House of Osman by far uh, has the longest reign. So there was a certain amount of legitimacy and um, merit to the system that was established by Mehmed II called the Law of Governance. Mehmed II was succeeded by his son Bayezid II, who ruled from 1481 until 1512. Now, Bayezid seems to have spent most of his reign at home, and he doesn't seem to really have been much of a conqueror when compared to most of his relatives. One of the things that he's most famous for is paying off the Pope and other Western powers to keep his brother and primary rival to the throne imprisoned. Now the Pope at the time had uh, the brother of Bayezid at, in his uh, possession and he wanted to possibly support him as a threat to the Ottoman throne, but because Bayezid was willing to pay money to keep the guy in jail, uh, the Pope was willing to collect. So that was sort of an interesting situation there. Um, but what Bayezid II is actually best known for 
is being the Ottoman Sultan in 1492 when Ferdinand and Isabella took over Spain and decided to expel all of the Muslims and Jews from its territory. So Bayezid mobilized the Ottoman fleet and sent it to Spain and ordered it to collect all the refugees and resettle them on Ottoman territory. And in fact, he threatened any governors who tried to refuse the refugees with death. And he said that he was going to take all of these people and achieve great prosperity by having their services and their talents at his disposal. And, you know, for the most part, it looks like the Ottoman Empire continued to really thrive, so maybe that had some small role in his success in the long run. I don't know. But for Bayezid II, uh, one of the things that really brings him down in the end is that his sons are looking to take power and they're bored. So they're worried about who Bayezid will pick as an heir, so the two sons, Selim and Ahmet, begin fighting a civil war. And Bayezid II will actually have to fight both of them in battle at various times. Eventually, Selim will take control and force his father to abdicate in 1512. Having overthrown his more or less peaceable father, Bayezid, Selim came to power and was determined to revert to the ways of Mehmed the Conqueror. And he would end up becoming one of the most important of all of the Ottoman sultans, and he would set a lot of policies and precedents that would really guide his successors, including his famous son, Suleiman. So, uh, Selim is actually the first of the Ottoman rulers who had to deal with the new Safavid Empire in Iran. Uh, the Safavids were Persian and Shia, and in this way they represented an alternative to the Sunni and Turkish empire under the Ottomans. So these two empires were natural enemies and they would clash for centuries. And this first clash occurred under Selim the Grim. Now at this time there was actually a three-way um, division in this area between major Muslim powers. You had the Mamluk Sultanate in the southwest, the Ottomans in the northwest, and then the Safavids in the east. Well, the only way that one of them would become dominant was by knocking out one of the other ones. So um, Selim fought a war against the Safavids who were pretty confident of victory. However, the Safavids, for whatever reason, had never embraced the gunpowder revolution, so Selim whooped them pretty bad. And with them out of the way for a while, he was then able to launch a campaign of conquest against the Mamluk Sultanate. So from 1516 to 1517, uh, Selim was able to conquer the entire Mamluk Sultanate. So everything from their territories in the north, like Syria, Palestine, and Arabia, to the Mamluk heartland in Egypt. And this, of course, would really add a lot of territory to the Ottoman Empire and make it into the Ottoman Empire that Suleiman was able to use to really threaten Central Europe. Um, and actually, the Ottomans would continue to pose a threat to Central Europe all the way up until at least 1683. And the only reason that they were able to do that ultimately is because Selim was able to conquer enough territory in the Middle East to give the Ottoman Empire um, the resources to really be a threat to all of Europe. Now, um, Selim earned his sobriquet the Grim for having a legendary temper, and he apparently executed many viziers, despite the fact that he really didn't rule for all that long. Um, there was a phrase at the time when people would get mad at each other, they would tell um, another person that they hoped that that person became a vizier of Selim, which is basically a way to tell someone to go die. Seems like all Eastern European insults are some variation of go die. And this is yet another one of those. Anyway, um, Selim died of an illness which could have been anything from cancer to poisoning while he was on a campaign in 1520, and that led to the accession of his son, Suleiman the Magnificent. However, while Suleiman is by far the best known of all Ottoman emperors, or excuse me, um, sultans, and usually it's um, agreed that the Ottomans reached their peak under Suleiman, um, what Suleiman accomplished would not have been possible without Selim, and since in many ways Suleiman was just fulfilling what Selim had set up, 
you could make the argument that Salim the Grim is the Philip II to Solomon's Alexander the Great. And he's someone that we really shouldn't overlook. Um, despite the fact that he apparently was not the nicest guy in the world. So anyway, um, that is how the Ottoman Empire became a dominant player in early modern Europe and how Selim set the Ottomans up to be that dominant power in early modern Europe and how they emerged from the Middle Ages and uh, you know moved into this new period of history. I hope this has been relatively clear and informative. I'll eventually have a follow-up video about the age of Suleiman and uh, his immediate successors going up to 1600. But you don't have to worry about that if you're a History 2202 student. That'll be something I'll be doing next year for a class that goes to 1600. So, and oh yeah, that means I'm recycling this video. Believe it. <laughs>